Masonry. John Burnside is uh, has published, I think, 11 collections of poetry. Uh, most recent of which, Black Cat Poem, uh, one that he has had the prize. Um, he's also a novelist. Uh, he's also written short stories. He teaches at the University of St Andrews, where, incidentally, I was I, I attended a festival in St Andrews earlier this year, Stanton, and I narrowly missed his. Very well received master class, as well as I think there was a poetic tour you were involved in. Was that you? Okay. Some sort of session. Um, anyway, there was plenty of poetry to be had. I also heard him much earlier at the Cambridge seminar and in the Edinburgh Festival. He's a fabulous reader. His poetry is wonderful, lyrical, tremendously influential. I'm a fan, so I don't really dare to say too much. I'm so in awe. I'm going to leave. John to say a few words to start, read us some of his work, whatever you would like, and I would please encourage all of you to come forward after that when we have time with questions, with comments, with requests, those of you who are fans, um, and we'll see how the evening goes. We've got about 60 minutes and so on and so forth. This is part of the Arts Houses uh, World Voices series. They bring in international writers from all over the world. Just last week we had a, well, earlier this, was it last week or this last week? We have a fabulous panel of uh, contemporary poets from Burma. They were, they were very well received indeed. And uh, we're hoping to see more other voices come in uh, later in the year. John appears uh, in partnership with the Melbourne Writers Festival where he's headed next Saturday after this. So please join me in welcoming. Near, near my hotel, 
and found the hotel called Hotel de Graal. And I thought, that's the hotel they should have put me in. Did they know, that? Did they know I was Scottish? <laughs> so um, I, I decided that to uh, imaginatively move to this hotel by writing this poem, Hotel de Graal. Sometimes I am troubled by the light that streams across the wall and disappears. Since every car that passes might be yours, you at the wheel, your body full of night, cicada songs, the scent of marguerites, the minor key of grace that runs for hours on country roads beneath a tide of stars more felt than seen. I'm sluggish with the heat and far too ready these days to believe you're there. A resurrection driving south for hours in Ora Mortis to arrive intact beneath my window. Time of death, a fiction in the holy end of dawn, and footprints new as rain crossing the lawn. So it's a, um, the connections extend to the dead, in other words, and um, I think, I don't know if it's particularly Scottish, probably not, but Scots often feel that they carry the dead along with them as they go, that the dead are always around, the dead are always around them, which is why Halloween is so important to us. And this is um, about my sister, this is uh, just a true story. Um, this really happened in 1965. It's called On the Vanishing of My Sister, age 3, 1965. They saw her last in our garden of stones and willows. A few bright, bright twigs and pebbles glazed with rain, and here and there, amidst the dirt and gravel, a slick of leaf and milkstone, beautiful for one long moment in the change of light. Then she was gone. My mother had looked away for a matter of seconds. She said this over and over, as if its logic could undo the wildness of a universe that stayed predictable for years and carried off a youngest daughter. My father was in the room at the back of our prefab, watching the new TV, in answer excited, Gold Cup Day, and Arkle romping home by 20 lengths. Maybe we have to look back to see that we have all the makings of bliss, the first spring light, the trees along the farm road thick with song. And surely it was this that drew her out to walk into the big wide world, astonished, suddenly at home no matter where she was. It seems when they found her, she wasn't the least bit scared. An hour passed, then another. My mother waited while our friends and neighbors came and went, my father running out to search, then back again, taking her once in his arms, and trying vainly to reassure her, she in her apron, dusted with icing and flour, and he too self-contained, too would be male, more awkward now than when he knew her first, a marriage come between them, all those years of good intent and blind misunderstanding. It was Tom Dow who brought her home, tears in his eyes, the boy we had always known as a local bully, suddenly finding himself heroic. And when they brought her in and sat her down, we gathered to stand in the light of her, life and death inscribed in the blue of her eyes and the sweet confusion of rescue, never having been endangered. She's married now, and Tom is married too, and I, like my father, strayed into discontent, not being what was wanted, strange to myself and wishing all the time that I was lost. Out at the end of winter, turning away to where the dark begins, far in the trees, darkness and recent cold, and the sense of another, far in the trees, where no one pretends I belong. <coughs> this is another song, this is another song, I can't pull me a mic that's not thing I've seen. Um, this is another poem from the 1960s, a 1960s memory. This is me and my mother. And uh, the central idea of this is the idea of Seneca, that um, 
the, 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 the epigraph is Paramangustra in a Kentia est ad legum bon an essay. Um, what kind of narrow innocence is it but just simply to be good according to the rules, according to the law? Um, that's not enough to be good. That's just simply not being bad, as it were. And the central idea of this is that, that, that the way children are brought up in plurality is, um, you know, you have to be good according to the rules that you don't actually understand. You just don't, don't do that, don't do that, and you'll be fine. As long as you don't do all those things. Thou shalt not, as it were. Um, and uh, I think there are better ways of doing it. So, so it's called Hall of Mirrors, 1964. It wasn't a fairground so much, just an acre of clay on old man Potter's land where someone had set up shop to amuse the locals. May weed and trampled grass beneath our feet. The perfumes that passed for summer in towns like ours touched now with the smell of candy floss and diesel and the early evening dust made eerie by those strings of fanny vert and powdered citrus light bulbs round the stalls where goldfish in their hundreds probed the walls with fish tanks for the missing Santa River. That day, my mother wore her rose print sundress, antique green and crimson in the off-white fabric, some new flora growing wild in infinite reflection while I turned and turned and couldn't find myself until she picked me out, a squat intruder in the garden she had made, blear-faced and discontent, more beast than boy, more fiend than beast. That wasn't me, of course. I knew as much. And yet I knew the creature I had seen, and when I turned again and saw him gazing back at me at infinitum, I knew him better. Baby-faced pariah, little criminal, with nothing to confess but narrow innocence and bad intentions. <coughs> the back rooms of the heart are Babylon incarnate, Miles of verdigris and towel, and the cries of hunting birds, unwooded for a kill that never comes. I saw that when I saw this other self suspended in its call of tortured glass, and while I tried pretending not to see, my mind a held breath in a house I'd got by heart from being good according to a law I couldn't comprehend. I saw, and I believe my mother saw, if only for a moment, what I was beyond the child she loved, the male homunculus she'd hoped I'd never find to make me like my father, lost and hungry, and another mouth to feed that never quit its ravening. A moment passed. I was convinced she'd seen, but when I turned to look, her face was all reflection, printed roses, and a blear of Eden from that distance in the glass where anything can blossom. Judas tree and tree of knowledge, serpents gnawing at the roots, the life perpetual is never ours alone, including us, till everything is quiet. Do a one check here. So, um, where I live, we have lots of power cuts. I live in the countryside in Scotland, and we have bad weather and we have poor electricity supplies. So, we have lots of power cuts. And, until you have enough power cuts, you don't realize that power cuts are the very essence of life. Um, we have far too much light in our lives, and it's much better to be in the dark more often than we are. And uh, you know, we, we, we have fun planning for the power cuts, and thinking about things we'll do when the power cut happens. And also it means that my children don't watch TV for a while, it's not good. But we, we have this, um, my sons are, have this um, terror of, of, of not they don't, they're not afraid of the dark, they're just afraid of not being able to switch on the light and know that it will work. You know? They can stay in the dark, but as long as they know they can through the light. So this is really about them. This is, this is again, this is just a true story, really. The, the quote in the poem, Foot Worn and Howled and Thin, Pollard and Thin, is a reference to the poem by Thomas Hardy. Um, so uh, um, that's why the title is. Power cut with Cheval Mirror, homage to Thomas Hardy. For my son. You woke up in the dark and came to find me, a sickle moon shedding its light in the narrow hole, that given the floorboards foot worn and hollow and thin, 
But you weren't afraid so much as confused. The doorwells occupied all of a sudden by something new. The feel of the house unfamiliar. Its fabric wedded to the land around us. Seeing eyes where we were blind. It isn't there a hint of thou to find in how the light reveals us all as wisps of distance in the mirror. When the candle wavers for a moment and we're lost in depth of field, a newfound history of presence in the dark, it's a self unseeing, barely the ghost you feared or hoped for, just the long familiar things made strange, as if you turned to find your bearings, whole as love and narrative, while just this once the known world looked away. Ladies and gentlemen, John. I'm, I'm struck by how you're extending to a degree the themes that you've been working with in your recent poetry. There's this sense of home and heart and um, uh, man's place or negotiation of place with the natural world, and a sense of uh, finding or trying to find uh, a resonance of kinship, I think is the word you use, with the other outside of the external environment. And I, I love that story about your children uh, in the dark, as it were, um, trying to flick the, you know, the sense of flicking a switch and getting or not quite getting a response. Um, with the switch, in some ways, standing in for the hum for human technology and human sense of control, or illusion of control over the world, where fundamentally it's the forces of physics, it's the forces uh, of light and dark that, that you know, call the shots. Yeah. Are these themes that you continue to work with? How have you brought them forward? Yeah, I think one of the things that happened to me when I was, when I was writing to begin with, I, I thought, okay, I've done that now. Mm -hmm. And you move on to a new book, it gives me completely different. But I still have that sometimes. Right. You know, as soon as I finish a book and it goes to the editor and they start looking at it, I think, now, time to do something completely different, as the Monty Python team used to say. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'll start writing something and I think, this is me. You know, um, we don't blame Kant for thinking about the same basic problems yeah. his whole life in his philosophy. But you know, um, we just say, well, you know, it's a deep, it's a deep subject, it's a difficult problem. So um, I'm, I'm happy now to continue to probe certain things that are my kind of territory for me. Um, and of course, then I have also have prose writing, so I can, if I if I need to escape into something nastier. And I can go and do that, as my prose tends to be with the last year. Um, he, he writes thrillers and murder stories. Yeah, and different, <laughs> but a little <laughs> different from the, not, you know, the unfortunate thing for me is that I don't fit into the categories that publishers choose. Yeah. So yeah. every now and again they do something like they, they categorize one, one book I wrote as a crime novel. Mm -hmm. And uh, in the States they put it out and uh, they put a really garish cover on it. It really looked like a thriller, it really looked like Stephen King kind of thing. And they even got somebody to give a quote saying it's like, you know, somebody important, like Peter Strauss, said, you know, this is like the new Stephen King or something. And uh, I got hate mail. <coughs> I got a guy writing to me saying, Sir, you're, you're an imposter. Uh, Stephen King's a genius. You're a nobody. And, and they went on for four pages like this, saying how awful I was and how great Stephen King was. So you have to be careful <laughs> how you get categorized. Well, the lucky thing about poetry is that nobody's going to compare to Stephen King. Who <laughs> knows? <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe you wish. One day, yeah. one day you write the poem as equivalent to, you know. Um, yeah. yeah your, your poetry is as good as Stephen King's. <laughs> <laughs> At least you, you didn't get compared to uh, Twilight. <laughs> Twilight, the Twilight series. No, 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 it's not that. Well, they didn't have that then, but maybe right. they will now. Next book. So, one of the questions that I'm sure you've been asked about, and uh, for our audience, it certainly continues to be pertinent. Is how do you negotiate the different uh, text types that you work with the different genres? When do you know this is going to be a poem, this is going to be a novel, or this is actually probably, I, I suppose the short story might be more comparable to the poem. When might an episode or an incident or an experience uh, be better encoded as a poem versus a short story? Uh, how, how do you play with those different forms? Uh, answers I don't because. Um the way I write poetry is so different from how I write prose. The, the, the very, very, you know, the seed moment, the germinating moment 
is significantly different. Um, when I'm writing prose, I have an idea, I have a character or something, and then I have to think about it in a very kind of conscious and active way, think about how I shape this. And, but, but poetry doesn't come to me like that. Poetry comes as a kind of rhythm, and sometimes even, it sounds a bit mystical maybe, but it's a kind of wordless rhythm, just something going on. And you know, you can feel something's coming, it's a poem coming, you know. But um, you're not sure it's about. And then something happens, and something happens over there, and they come together. And again, you're not consciously doing it, I'm not consciously doing anything. And then some, a line forms, or a few lines form. And I don't write anything down. I, you know, I usually, I used to when I wrote, wrote short poems, and these days are a bit long, I used to write the poem, I composed the poem, you might say, in my head, and then write it down on paper. And I felt that that was more authentic in a sense. I don't believe in the word authentic anymore, but I believe it was authentic then because it was closer to the oral tradition. And also, I felt that um, you know, if you sit down on a piece of paper and decide to write a poem, you're going to write a poem. You're going to be not very good, I imagine. But if it's memorable enough to come back from a walk and you've got 12 lines in your head and you can still remember them, then it's probably worth writing them down. So it's such a different method that I can always tell the difference, pretty much. Yeah, I've often told my you know, people I work with with creative writing and so on that poetry is what, what in a sense sticks in their head. It's, mm -hmm. it's the memorable uh, components or aspects or en encapsulations of experience. And in, in your case, your writing with poetry is carried along as well by a very strong sense of rhythm, means a, 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 a musicality. Even when you were reading, I'm sure you could hear um, you know, the, the, the meter tripping along as it were. That carries you. Yeah, I would, I, would, I would make one distinction there between, I mean, actually my, my stuff is very regular compared to a lot of British writers yes. who write magical poetry. Um, I write, I, I still probably write strongly in some American poets, and I write syllabics. I don't tend to be, I mean, there aren't magical poems in the book, but um, I, I more often probably write syllabics. But what I really think is really important is, is, is for me is that kind of irregularity. You're, you're working, it's a bit like regular stars drumming. You don't think the Beatles a great band, it wasn't John Lennon and Paul McCartney, it was George, McCart George Harrison's guitar playing, and Ringel was always just off the beat. If you listen to this, especially like an album like Revolver, Ringel's just off the beat, and that's what really makes it interesting. And I think that's what I want to do with poetry, is be, you know, just a little bit off so that people are yeah. expecting this to happen, and it happens before just after, that kind of thing. Yeah, you're yeah. obviously not caged into a particular strip, strip jacket form, but you're tripping forward. Yeah, exactly. I like the word tripping in there, like, yeah, yeah. And then and, and the thing is the British, sorry, not, not in that context. Yeah, yeah. Um, but the British, a lot of British <laughs> feeling right now is still that, you know, very yeah. formal and, you know, traditional version. Okay, fine, if you want to do that, that's fine. I've got no objection to someone doing that. But I find it a little dull, I have to say. When it's, when it's very much wedded to, to traditional form. It's a bit like the British people playing jazz, you know? They play, <laughs> they play traditional jazz and they just make it sound like New Orleans circa 1928. And, and everybody else has moved on, you know? In Scandinavia, they play amazing jazz because they give themselves freedom to do what they like. And surely jazz and anything should give you freedom to do what they like, but so should poetry, you know? Classical jazz. What about the, the receptive experience? Do your, do your audiences get a different genre inside? Uh, it's, obviously, they work between you know, your novels, your short stories, or your poetry. Would you say that there is something still distinctively of your voice uh, working across the line? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, it's the same question writing it. Yeah. Um, I think it's often happened that people who read my poetry have read a book of my prose or came to a prose event for the first time. And, came, and, and people have come up to me at readings after prose event saying, oh, you know, I thought you were a nice guy, I liked your poems, you know, your poems <laughs> are so nice. And I said, you know, well, it's just stories. And I remember one lady, it was very sweet, um, a friend of mine uh, did a, at a kind of book reading club, book reading group, and she chose one of my books for this. And um, I came to talk to the group. And this lady said, um, this is my first novel, it's pretty nasty. And um, this lady put her hand up and said, um, you seem like a nice person. And I said, well, I try my best. <laughs> and uh, she said, well, you know, why happen you? It's such a horrible book. I said, well, you know, it's, it's, it's just imagination. I'm making it up. And she said, no, no, 
there's no smoke without fire. <laughs> it, it's probably how you stay nice by getting it out of the <laughs> are, are, are there any questions from the floor at this point? Yeah. Well, uh, I mean, very interesting you mentioned about the difference between somehow you were writing both form and free verse and prose. And I also dealt with the same question when I wrote poetry. In the sense that when I was younger, I used like sonnets, being familiar with those like word forms and being junkies. So I was like thinking, okay, this poem should be a form poem. It isn't a form poem, it's not poems. It is this But then I realized that I was forcing the muse because some of the poems didn't fit into any category or it became free verse essentially. So like you compose your poems with it. I'm just wondering how do you tell whether it's a form poem or not form poem? And let's say, for example, a standard of four lines comes out and it happens with A, B, A. And would you say, would you feel that it's going to be solid and round in a couplet or would you break the rules and Maybe add a 15 line to make a broken sound or something. Yeah, I, mean, I think to begin with, the thing to. We don't always know it when we start. The poem starts forming, but I think the poem knows where it wants to be. You know? I, I've heard it's attributed to Robert Frost that the only real job the poet has is not get in the way of the poem. Mm -hmm. You know? The poem knows what it wants to be, it's coming. And it's going to come and arrive. And hopefully you don't just don't swallow it. You just write it down. You know? So I think I, I would very rarely find it um, feasible even to think that I would start off thinking of forming a poem in a certain form or structure and not have it continue on its own accord in that form or structure. I think the other thing I want to think of more you said was the question of free verse. This is a really difficult question that I, I, I constantly discuss with my students. Um, in the context of reading, not, 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 not writing, what is free verse? What do we mean by free verse? So often the term free verse is used to say, as John Dee Stubbs said, it was chopped up prose. And the essence of poetry is music. And music, the essence of music is some kind of rhythmic, um, you know, inventiveness and structure. Um, so I often I look at people's poetry to say when well, I'm um, working with them, and I say, um, I don't feel the music of this. They say, no, no, it's free verse. I say, well, no, no, free verse is in prose, but it breaks. You're just, all you're doing is being environmentally unsound by not writing all this again. You have to have the music, and I think there's rhythmic, there's always rhythmic elements that make the music happen. Of course, the thing is that most ideas of what verse tradition is around the world, I imagine even here, based on European models. Actually, that's even not even fair in a way because they're based on European models that Europeans stole from Moors, North Africans, and, and Middle East. Because that's where they got, you know, the sonnet didn't come from Italy, really. They stole it they brought it into Italy. And it's all oh, what we invented. <laughs> um, but we're based on these traditions. And in, in America, um, people are writing, I don't even know how to say it, Gazals. And um, people are trying this format. And it's interesting, I think, can you make that work in English? You know, uh, I grew up at a time when people, every, every second person was writing haiku every 10 minutes. And I said, you can't write haiku in English. It's a Japanese art form, you know, you can't do it in English. I still, I'm somewhat convinced you can. But I don't know if Gazelles can be done in English. There's a poet called John Robert Robert Atkinson. Sorry? Robert Bly. Robert Bly? Yeah. yeah he, and our, our own Alfian Zahar has written some really quite effective concerns. And he, of course, borrows directly from, from his own uh, tradition yeah. as well. It works in English, but it's not common. No, no, no. I mean, you have to know, you have to study the tradition. You have to say, oh, I'll try that. I think I can figure that one out. Yeah, it's like the haiku, right? It's not 575, that's a yeah, haiku. That's it's a lot more than that. Exactly. I, I, when I was trying to get over my last book, and before I wrote this book, I started writing pantoum. Because they're just because they were difficult. And they're they're just stealing from us. Now. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but it wasn't native to me to write that to. And so I was sitting there, you know, deliberately, and I thought, this is not how I write. But I thought, this is, this is such fun to try and do it. I even published one, it was a mistake. No, I won't have <laughs> published it. Some magazine is asking for it. But you know, I think it's really important that we, we use all the use tradition that you come from. Um, we, and, you know, in Scotland, we have other things besides the ballads we can use, and I've used some of those special short forms 
and curses. And in Scott, in Scots, the curses can be really powerful. So you can tell just from the sound of it, something's going to happen to feel well tonight. You know? So learn, one learns from all of those things, not just from sonnets and villanelles and things. I, I would just add that one, one, one of the things that we are slowly learning and trying to get overcome is that of course, the cultural cringe. And in a sense, our writers should feel more free to borrow from the traditions, both that nourish us and we're very diverse over here, as well as other traditions that we come across in our journeys and our education the world's a much broader place now. So if you can if you can, you know, bring in a Cantonese curse into your budget, <laughs> why the heck not? Exactly. Um, um I sort of uh, was introduced to your work but through the uh, um, I was introduced to your work through the, uh, your fiction. I, I read the scary <laughs> novel and everything else after that, which was just as scary. <laughs> and uh, I read your uh, memoirs as well. So I, I, I'm sort of a bit different from, I, I would say, from the, some of the people here because uh, I'm probably going to get close to saying this, but I've not read any of the poetry, despite the fact that I actually did recommend it, like, to get it. Um, but well, I, I suppose with your new collection itself, I noticed there were teams of family and your mother and your father, which I think you covered quite comprehensively in your first memoir, which is a lot yeah. about your father. So I was just wondering, with your latest uh, collection of short stories, which is, uh, I can't remember the title, but it had the word happy. It's called something like happy. Yeah, so I was just wondering, just depending on the title itself, and with all your past history and your memoirs itself, I mean, sort of, as Elvin said, you got it all out of the system. I mean, are you genuinely <laughs> happy, or are there still some darkness in you that, that you need to explore in your writing? Because it's still quite dark, even with the latest collection. It's not, it's not very happy. <laughs> That's um, a good question. Um, actually, what you said man, reminded me of a cartoon I saw the other day. It's a guy sitting in a bar and he's obviously very drunk. I'm talking to the barman and he's obviously been boring this barman for a long time. And, then he, and, 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 and he's obviously at this point where he says, and then even my misery memoir failed. <laughs> <laughs> so that's a bad life. My misery memoir did quite well. So, so um, I understand what you're saying. Uh, I think what my argument, the book, something like Happy, which is the book of short stories, um, the argument, in a sense, underneath it all is the, the fantasy that certainly besets the society I live in is that we should be happy. Like, you know, as, as a switched on to a permanent condition of happy, as in, you know, as in putting your air conditioner on to 21 degrees or whatever. You know, we should always be happy. And we can't always be happy, you know. There's a few stars who are always unhappy, but that's what it's <laughs> But you know, we can't also, the, the very distinction of happiness um, is, is that this is, a, this is an experience I'm having which is different from other experiences that I have. And um, I think we actually cheat ourselves of moments of happiness, moments of, um, I hate to use terms like epiphany and stuff, but those kinds of experiences, we cheat ourselves of those because we're trying to be happy all the time, you know. I've got 7,000 friends on Facebook, that kind of stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know how Facebook works, so I'm very, very lucky I don't have to say that. I haven't got any friends on Facebook. Um, but you know, that kind of feeling of, of happiness being this, this, this false heaven, this kind of false paradise. So the book is really about people who aren't happy in the way that society tries to deem that you're happy, but experience moments of revelation, happiness, just moments sometimes, very brief moments in fact, in a couple of cases. But this is the high point. You get, you get high points by having low points and medium points. And I think it's really, in a sense, it's a kind of protest against society which wants us all to go around with those kind of emoticons on our faces, you know. Hi, <laughs> I'm John. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm obviously completely stupid because I'm happy all the time, right? Um, and, and, uh, and the thing about working out one system, I actually, I've never written anything to work something out of my system in the sense that I can only start writing about an experience after I've kind of mentally congested it. So I wrote the book about my father and myself 
after he died, and after I spent quite a lot of time thinking about my own responsibility in that relationship, because relationships go two ways. Even when it's a person of such power and a small child, there's still different ways of responding that happen. And I responded pretty badly when I was in my teens. So I've gone through all that, and, was, and the other thing that's happening is I was expecting my first son. My wife was expecting my first son. I, I was also expecting, but in a more remote way. Um, <laughs> but you know, I wanted to think about, I was thinking about my family history from that point of view as well. That's when the book came. I didn't plan to write the book. I was actually having a conversation with someone, and much like our conversation right now, they said to me, so what's your next project? And I said, I'm going to write a book about my father. Where did that come from? You know, but it was a, for me it was a very rewarding experience, but not, not as therapy or catharsis, but actually as a record of having gone through, um, you know, gone, gone through that, forgiving him and myself for what we've done to each other. And if you're interested in the books, um, the National Library has copies. They're currently with me at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a different issue, but one of the problems we do have with bookstores here in Singapore. We buy a lot of books, we read a lot of books, but for some reason bookstores uh, want to bring in books that make us happy all the time, uh, rather than works of uh, serious literary fiction, poetry and so on. So a lot of, a lot of the work of uh, talking about this work is to say there are books like that out there. Uh, look for them, get them, badger your bookstore, get them, buy them, Amazon and so on and so on. I recommend the library I recommend the library to buy them. Thank you very much. That's probably why I got my copy. There's another question over there from Eric. Can you tell us about the influence of Boyko and the other visual artists in your poetry? Oh yeah, sure, yeah. yeah. Um, the first poem I wrote about that was directly responding to an artist's work was about Stanley Spencer. And I, I, I Love Stanley Spencer's work as a kind of frankness about his work. Um, and I decided that I wasn't going to write a poem about a specific painting, I wanted to write a poem which would pretend to be a Stanley Spencer painting. And I wrote this, wrote this poem and I read it at reading. And afterwards, a lady in the audience came to me, I, I, I love that poem, it says, I, that's my favorite painting of his. Okay, yeah, that must be a successful poem. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, but there's been a lot of um, interest in the ekphrastic experience of uh, writing poetry in response to, to visual art. One of the people I've, I would recommend strongly is an American poet called Linda Gregerson, um, who writes about all kinds of artists, including contemporary artists, so sculptors, for example. Um, Bruegel, for me, is, you know, it's, 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 that, it's that thing that people draw a circle around. You know, I, I, I published a sequence of poems called Four Quartets. I thought, well, you know, why not? You know, you're, you're going to get vilified for calling anything Four Quartets. Um, and I thought, well, you know, next year I'll, I'll do Orden instead. You know, that, but what happened was, I was actually in the Musée de Beaux Arts, and um, I was looking at the paintings, and, I, and I was, my mind was trying to make a poem. And I was thinking, but my conscious mind was saying, you're not allowed to do that. Orton's done that. You can't be, you don't invite comparison with W.H. Orton, you idiot. <laughs> <laughs> so um, eventually my intuitive mind overcame that. And um, mainly because of the response to, it was after, after looking at the painting so much, I was, I was staying in Brussels for about 10 days or seven or eight days. And I went every day, I had a, a few hours every day, and I went every day to look at the paintings. And um, but also looking at other work of Bruegel's and people's commentaries on them. And one of the things that would happen with Bruegel is, especially with some of his prints, later on, 100, 200, 300 years later, but people were much more into kind of quite simplistic moral, moral messages coming out of art, people would inscribe onto a print of Bruegel's some kind of, you know, little, you know, morale kind of thing of it, you know. And I read one of them, which is, it was uh, not that the painting that I used in this book, but another paint, another print about, about people skating and uh, the, the, um, the 200, 250, 200 years later someone had described on this, you know, and this is how we go through life, slipping and sliding, you know, and I thought, oh, it's such a simplistic view of what Broid was trying to do, 
Now, the, the poor man has been in a kind of angry response to this kind of simplistic treatment of a work of art, which is a great work of art, the, the, the book of the bird trap, the skaters of the bird trap. And, uh, you know, I think, I think people will take the children to, to art galleries and say, look, children, look around, find a painting and write about it. And the kids go and write about it and say, well, she's got a blue dress on and the man likes her, I think. You know, that kind of stuff. But when you're responding to a work of art because of a strong feeling of, I, I, you know, I, I feel this strong personal response and it, really, it, 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 work, it works in my life at a level that most of my friends don't. You know, that, that feeling a work of art does to you. And then that kind of response is, you know, it's going to be interesting, at least personally. Um, should I read that poem, actually? Yes, please. Um, it's one of the few I still like reading this book, actually. And uh, there, there is, while, while you're on the subject of Bruegel, I just come from the, the Lichtenstein uh, exhibition. There's an exhibition of uh, art, art pieces from the Oh, right. the collection. They've got a couple of Bruegels. Oh, really? Start the road with the king. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> Including one about there's a winter scene and there's a, the name of Bethlehem. A number of Bethlehem. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah. That's the, 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 the census. Bethlehem. The census. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so this poem is called Peter Bruegel, Winter Landscape with Skaters and Bird Trap, 1565. Good, that's almost half a poem done with that. <laughs> <laughs> and then there's the epigraph. And it's, uh, the epigraph is, is this, it's the English translation of this thing that was scribbled on his print. Learn from this picture how we journey in the world, slithering as we go, the foolish and the wise. I just don't think Freud would have subscribed to that sense of it at least. He was far more sophisticated than mine. So here we are, the skaters. We can picture the, the, the painting, I think. The river widening away, the village, the bird trap in the right hand corner, and the skaters out in the ice, the kids playing, and makeshift hockey, etc. We have to imagine the duties they leave behind for the thrill of the river. The kitchens and middens, the sheepfolds and clouded byres, the old folk in their sick beds, mumbling prayers. The day is bright. And this is their escape from hardship. But each has his private hurt, her secret dread. The man who starts thirsty and tired, his body soured with last night's schnapps, then skates out to the bridge at breakneck speed, away from the loveless matron he's had to endure for decades. The woman in blue and gray, keeping pace with her child, untroubled for now, but never released from the fear that her husband will catch her, wasting his precious time, and beat her as he's beaten her for years the moment he gets her home. At midstream, the children play with makeshift hockey sticks, and near the church, a man finds the thoughtless grace of the boy he once was to glide free in the very eye of heaven. It could be simple, paradise foreseen, but up on the rightmost bank, amid thorns and briars, someone has built a bird trap from a plank set on a perch from which a length of rope snakes to a half-closed door. And all around it, birds dip from the air, starlings and field fairs, red wings, unaware of any danger. It seems a fable, and perhaps it is. We live in peril, die from happenstance, a casual slip, a fault line in the ice. But surely it's the other thought that matters, the sense that now and then there's still a chance a man might slide towards an old belonging, momentarily involved in nothing but the present, skating out towards a white horizon, fair and gifted with the grace to skate forever, slithering as he goes, but hazarding a guess that someone else is close beside him, other to his other. I absolutely adore that last line. And, and relative to the other poems in the book, it's quite significant in this one, isn't it? In a sense, uh, this idea of finding a correspondence in the landscape or in the environment. Yeah, the other. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think it's interesting. The philosophers who deal with the idea of the other 
mostly French, or the ones who are interested are mostly French, which is mostly true of philosophy anyway. Um, but uh, they, they are talking mostly about the human other, or there's a convention to understand them as talking about the human other. But um, I don't see why I should stop at the human other. Um, and I've written a lot about, uh, in prose, and, and mostly the things that I, I, I do a column for the new statesman of nature, about the gaze of the other animal. And, and encountering the gaze of, of, of other animals, there's something about that which is just so wonderful. And, and, and that's at the at the heart of the poem that the long poem that introduces black and gold. Yeah. So it's at the heart of yeah. uh, encountering that gaze in the animal or creature. It's never quite explained what it is. Yeah. It's hunting. Yeah, I, mean, I think hunters do more understand better actually than, than most of us. Most of our, well, and certainly in the UK, most human beings live in towns and cities. Most human beings have very little encounter with other, especially wild animals. Um, but, you know, try it. Try an experiment sometime. Go in a field where there's horses and look at the horse. Look at a horse in the face. You know. It's just a, it's a great experience. Better than a lot of other things. I mean. um, but animals look at us in a certain way. And, and Auden is interesting on this. You know, the, um, He writes about um, the sense of um, the, the kind of sadness of animals. He, the, of, 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 he knows he's projecting onto the animal. It's his sadness that he's projecting onto the animal. But we have the sense that we're separate from nature by culture. But the other side of it is the whole idea of the face, the face anyway. <coughs> and Levinas with his idea of the face, um, encountering the face of the other. And if you go and see a Pasolini movie, um, especially something like the Gospel according to Matthew, where he does this thing where he puts the camera on someone's face and keeps it there, just so much longer than people feel comfortable looking at a person. That is, it's a wonderful experience, because you, you get to look at this person's face. We're not allowed to look each other in the face um, for too long, when we're present with somebody. But if you're filming someone, you can. And it's, it's wonderful, it's one in particular there's a, a kind of old peasant guy, and he's just looking at the camera, and the camera's looking at him, and he knows that somebody's behind that camera looking at him, but he's just looking back at it, you know. It's wonderful. There's also, there's also an expectation of intimacy, isn't it? When, when you lock a gaze, yeah, yeah. and you usually lock gazes with a loved one, yeah. something you want to engage in very closely. So to lock a gaze with a strange creature or with a strange person puts us a little... Although so it can be easier than looking at someone you've lived with for 20 years. Okay. <laughs> sometimes, sometimes it's hard for people to live with each other for 20 years to look at each other than to look at a stranger on the street. Uh, I, I want to pick up a thread that, that we were uh, discussing over the email when we were first planning this. You mentioned that you want to talk a, a little bit about environmentalism. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, do, is, is this a good point to bring it in? Does it relate to what we're talking about? Natural well, it does. I mean, I, I was down at the gardens by the um, day there, and I, I thought it was wonderful some of the, the educational stuff that was the materials there. Um, not many people were using it, they were just looking at the flowers and going away. Um, but it's nice to have that material there for people to look at. Um, the problem right now, certainly in the UK, is that everybody is subscribing to the, the, you know, the generic environmental ideas, you know, green ideas. And of course, there's a constant process of business in particular, the government too, of appropriating things that are valid and interesting in terms of environmentalism and ecology, and then rebranding it and making, and making it something we can consume. Um, and what we should all be, as citizens, we should all be on the, on the lookout for this. Um, in Scotland right now, the big problem is, we have a guy called Alex Salmon in Scotland. We refer to him as the Salmon. Sometimes we refer to him as Shrek, because he actually <laughs> looks like the character Shrek. In the and you've never seen Shrek and Alex Salmon in the same room. But we have this guy, Alex Salmon, his green credentials rest entirely on this idea of introducing wind turbines to Scotland. Now, Scotland's a small country. A large part of Scotland is wildland with eagles and hen harriers and, you know, you name it. And one of the great features is our, our native birds. And we've got these turbines being put up on wild land. And the John Muir Trust is currently trying to fight this. 
But there are so many people, uh, armchair greens, sitting in Edinburgh in their, in their comfy flats and saying, oh, wind turbine is a good thing. Say, no, they kill lots and lots of birds. Oh, no, they don't. No, that's negligible. And where did you get that information? I actually wrote to Friends of the Earth and said, tell me, what, why are you not concerned about the number of birds that are being killed by wind turbines? And said, oh, the number of birds is negligible. And I said, where's the source of information? The AWEA, the American Wind Energy Association. <laughs> it's a bit like saying to, uh, to a car driver, to a car manufacturer, do cars kill pedestrians occasionally? No, no, hardly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. In fact, I wrote back to them and said, you know, you, you, you're trusting the AWEA on this. It's like me trusting the American Coal Association people who are saying that coal is the future for environmental um, and energy, uh, environmental safe energy. Yeah. Um, I was about to, uh, sorry. Um, I was about to uh, mention um, Alex Sam because I, I, I just thought that um, I had a quick flip through your poetry itself. So, um, there's really nothing political in your poetry itself, but within sort of standing out with the Scottish referendum itself and saying that because Scotland has a lot of oil, we don't need England or we don't need the UK. I mean, since you mentioned the environment itself, I mean, what's your opinion on that from a poet's point of view? From a poet's point of view? Yes, so well, the fact that you know, Scotland has all of that oil, we don't need the we, we still We still do have oil resources in the North Sea. It's true. And um, Alan Salmond also said they want to transform Scotland into the Saudi Arabia of wind energy. <laughs> now, I, I don't know. I don't, I, I'm not enamored with my government, but as far as I know, you know, they still let women drive. <laughs> um, you know, this, this idea of transforming yourself into this or transform. Scotland is Scotland. Scotland should be looking after Scotland, the Scotland that it has. And not trying, you know, he's saying things like, we'll, we'll soon be selling our energy to, to England because England doesn't have, you know. And, oh, get over yourself, idiot. Um, Fran if England needs to buy energy, it might from France, which has got a, a, you know, a nuclear power program which makes it for very cheap energy. That's where they're going to buy it. Germany used to be a net exporter of electricity, of energy. Now Germany's a net importer. Because they got rid of their nuclear program. I'm not saying I'm pro nuclear, by the way. I'm just saying they got rid of their nuclear program and shut down a lot of coal without having any alternative except wind energy, which doesn't work, as we already know. Um, and now they're importing energy from Czech Republic and France, both nuclear, mostly nuclear. The Czech Republic's uh, um, nuclear energy program is actually dirtier than German was. German is one of the cleanest in the world. And so now they're saying, we don't have any uh, nuclear power plants, aren't we good? But we buy our energy from the Czech Republic. We're producing dirty energy, nuclear energy, compared to what we used to do. It's a bit like saying, I don't beat my wife anymore, I get my friend to do it. <laughs> he's much like, he's, he's much gentler than me, you know. He hasn't got his grudge against them. You know, it's, it's such a ridiculous piece of hypocrisy. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I was in Berlin just recently, and my friends are, are fuming, you know. Because what happens is we have politicians blowing in the wind, pardon, pardon that, but they just blow with anything that goes, and there's a big emotional thing, oh, you know, we've got to have wind, we've got to have wind, this wind is good. But it's not working, it's just not working. Good economists, good environmentalists, and good engineers all have said, forget it, let's find something else. I mean, the sad thing is we have got other things, and a friend of mine, for example, was, was working on Really interesting research on a tidal energy, you know, um, and you know that you can get the money to do the work, to do the research, to find out whether or not this is feasible, and what kind of level it's feasible. I'm not saying that all wind energy should be moved up. You can you can use wind in certain areas where it has a low environmental impact, but it isn't. It simply isn't productive enough. You know, and it certainly isn't worth the cost of losing some of your most important um, top predators, in some cases, like golden eagles and harriers and stuff, losing them for a political, you know, for a political plus tick in your box, you know. So this is a good way from poetry. No, well, <laughs> yeah. I, I was going to ask, it's, it's obviously a subject that you're well versed in and passionate about. Uh, in, in your view, what is 
the role or the responsibility of the artist, of the writer, um, in relation to these issues like that? The same as any, actually, to be honest, the same as any other citizen, which every single citizen should be making it their duty to learn what needs to be known to be able to influence the people in power uh, and actually take it away from them, of course, um, to, to actually do the right thing with regard to our environment. So that's our duty. It's, it's our environment. I mean, you know, we've got other problems in Scotland like land. Don't get me started on land. <laughs> you know, but we've got uh, Scotland is a, is, is a feudal society virtually in the countryside. You know, really, once you get to the cities, there's these guys that own everything, and they do. And they, and they, they won't say, "I will do what I damn well please with it," and I will get a grant for doing so. By the way, I'll get subsidy for doing it. <laughs> that's the thing. We pay them to destroy our environment. Now, you know, it makes you kind of angry. Um, and every now and again, my piece from the New Statesman gets a little bit of blue pencil and I advocate actual homicide. But, you know, um, I think as a poet, on the other hand, I think it's probably counterproductive to go on saying, oh, isn't it terrible? Mm. You know, isn't it awful? These people are doing this and this is happening. But what you can do, I think, is celebration. You say, isn't this bird amazing? Learn about the bird first, and then you say, isn't nature wonderful, like that old Monty Python sketch? You, you observe the bird and you say, it's just, you know, isn't there something amazing about this? Wouldn't it be off? By implication, it wouldn't be off if you lost it. But I think writing, you know, very, very problematic political poetry doesn't, doesn't work for me particularly, you know. It's probably counterproductive. Yeah, I mean, even the most political poets that we think of, like some of them, Miguel Hernandez, most of his great poetry is about celebrating the things that Franco was trying to destroy, not saying isn't Franco a bad guy, you know. But it's like, yes. Yeah. Uh, Well-known person who had been framed and 
you have to compose a poem in certain steps uh, uh, to stave off its execution. Uh, it's, it's one of those things. So this idea of walking and having uh, the rhythms, internal rhythms, sort of sync with that, it's, it's, it goes way back. Yeah, yeah. Sami people in North Norway, the, Sami, the, the, the reindeer people, uh, because there's, there's 13 different kinds of Sami people, but in North Norway, they have that tradition of, of, of you know, walking, but also, um, they're informed by the uh, elemental factors that run through their lives. For example, the wind is really important. So there's a Sami poet who died in 1999, I think. His name is Adlai He was always talking about the wind. The wind is coming. The rhythm of the wind, you know. And in fact, um, Sami Yoik originated, people think anyway, as um, a way of, um, almost like a lullaby for the radio. They would sing these songs to calm the radio when there were wolves or, or um, uh, wolverines around because the radio would get nervous. You know? And then the, the women would go out and sing to the radio and, and, and calm them down. So. Uh, we have time for perhaps, I want to take perhaps one more question and uh, before I invite John to maybe close with one more. Uh, but one last question. <laughs> well, maybe we'll, we'll perhaps take both and yeah. maybe your answer can encompass both. Singapore. That's what always happens. It kind of 
you know, it's recollection and tranquility, I suppose, to some extent. But I often find that I, I don't really get what I'm after until I leave the place. You know? Because sure then you remember it. Sorry? I share a sense of it. Yeah. Yeah. And, and of course, it also feels presumptuous, you know, this is my first day, this is my first, I've just been here for 24 hours now. Um, to presumptuous to actually write about this thing, well nothing's actually happening yet, but I feel something's on the way. Um, but presumptuous to say, I'm going to write about this place, I've been here for about a day. You want to have a secondary, uh, secondary impression and not the first hand. Yeah, yeah. So imagine, yeah. with new things about it. And of course, one never is writing about Singapore, this was one one's writing about one's own soul, and hopefully what other people's will find in reflection of that, you know, that mirror. So uh, the setting liberates something in oneself. And that's a great place to move on to perhaps finish. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, Thank <laughs> you.